Thank you for the introduction, and um, it's a pleasure to be here, such a lovely conference. And first off, uh, I'll try to explain a very simple principle to you. So I hope everybody can follow along, and I prefer questions along the way, right away, if you don't understand what's going on, rather than, than taking them at the end. Um, so feel free to, to interrupt if you uh, want. And uh, first off, this is not my work alone. Uh, uh, this is based on a paper that I wrote together with um, these uh, five great guys. And it was, uh, Mehdi was supposed to be here, but uh, the French authorities unfortunately didn't think he was allowed to, to travel from Spain to, to France. So um, he's uh, hopefully seeing this uh, from home at some point. Um, so, <clears throat> Point patterns, so, so my uh, research uh, interest has been point patterns, and the important thing here is when we talk about spatial data, as m many of you probably know, because you work in spatial, uh, in the spatial field, is that you can either have fixed locations where you measure something, or you can have things occurring at random locations. And this is what I'm interested in, is uh, spatial point patterns. They don't have to be spatial, but that's uh, where my main interests uh, have been. So it's a random occurrence of an unknown number of points in some region. Uh, the top uh, plot here is uh, the faithful geyser, uh, geyser eruptions uh, from uh, the data sets package in R, where we just have the duration of, uh, of a geyser. Uh, so this is a more of a it's easier to illustrate some of the things on the real line rather than in 2D. So I just have that as uh, to do some illustrations. More relevant uh, 1D kind of data is a linear network. So that's what we have. Um, these are street crimes uh, around the University of Chicago uh, from a specific uh, two-week period. Um, and uh, the, the red circles are indicating where we have uh, a street crime occurred. There's additional information about what type of crime it was. Um, but, uh, but I've discarded that here. And then finally, there's a, a, a spatial region, a polygon, where we have uh, occurrences of where people live uh, that have been diagnosed with a specific type of cancer. Again, it's actually two types of cancer. I discarded that here. That's not important for my purposes. Uh, the first underlying thing driving uh, a point process um, is the intensity function. So the intensity function is just telling you how many points do I get in a, a specific area? If the intensity is high, we get many points. If it's low, we get few points. Uh, so we could think there is this underlying function that determines the points, and then the, the function in the network is illustrated by the width of the, of the lines where there's high intensity and low intensity. And based on this intensity, then the points are generated. Um, then, then we add the points. Um, and uh, in the simplest case, it's just a Poisson uh, case, then there are just independent points everywhere. Um, so how do we go about just giving the points to estimate the intensity? Of course, uh, there are, are many different ways to do this, and that's what I, I'll talk about, one specific method. So basically, we just have an unnormalized probability density. So rather than integrating to the probability of something happening in this area, it integrates to the number of points occurring in this area. So if you can figure out how to do uh, density estimation, well, you can also do intensity estimation. Uh, so the most common thing, if it has to be non-parametric, which a lot of people like for the first exploratory things, um, and if you just want some kind of mean estimate to look at controlling for the mean, what are, do the interactions and the higher order moments look like, then you want as, as few assumptions as possible in your first uh, step. And the kernel smoothing is probably the most common thing. There you just have to, to, to decide on a kernel, uh, typically the Gaussian one, and then a bandwidth. And the bandwidth, uh, hopefully the magic uh, thing happening in density.default is a good bandwidth for you. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but that's, of course, uh, the difficult thing about kernel smoothing is choosing the bandwidth. And uh, another uh, thing is there's this call called the uh, nearest neighbor density estimation. And something very close to related is the Voronoi estimator. And that's what I'll take as the starting point. Um, and then we'll improve that or, or change that. So the Voronoi estimator is easily explained on the real line. So take a unit interval as we have here. And then um, we have four data points. Those are the red circles at 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 4, and 8. And then what we do is just make the Voronoi uh, tessellation of the real line, basically dividing the line into the areas that's closest to this data point. 
So uh, the first data point has the interval from 0 to 0 0.2. The second interval, uh, second data point has from 0 0.2 to 0 0.35 and so on. So we have these blue breakpoints. And then you could just say, well, in each of these areas, one point occurred. So uh, that's a, a total of one. So we make a, a normalized histogram, um, basically. So um, um, you get these different steps. So you just take one over the, uh, the area size as the, um, as the height. So in that last interval, for instance, which is 0 0.4 long, then you have to have one divided by 0 0.4. That'll be 2.5. So the intensity in that area is 2.5. That's the Voronoi intensity estimator. It's very easy to construct um, and, uh, and to understand. The problem with it is that it's approximately unbiased. Uh, you can have something with edge effects. We won't go into that. But the variance is huge. Imagine you have two points very close to each other. You can get a very close or very small cell around that data point, and you get a huge intensity estimate. Uh, so basically, you, you end back at, okay, you have something completely non-parametric. There's no choice, but then that's really annoying because then you have a huge variance. So you want to, again, introduce some tuning parameter to reduce the variance and introduce a bit of bias. And, uh, and our idea is to do some subsampling. Uh, to illustrate this, um, here is uh, a leave one out subsampling. So if I removed one of the data points we had before, the first one, I get this new intensity estimate. I can do that for each of the data points. And, um, and we see how the intensity changes and the breakpoints move around because it's, it's a nonlinear thing uh, happening here. So you get your, your, your jump points are switching around, et cetera. So that would give us um, the, the graph on the top right if we take the average of those four graphs. So if you look at this one and say, now we have four different intensity estimates. So take the average. Um, that's the one on the top right. If we leave two out and do all six combinations, then we get the one uh, on the bottom left. And finally, if we only keep one point, then there's one interval. It just has the, the height one. Um, and of course, um, if you just use the, the intensity estimate directly, then you're, you're cheating, right? Because you, you, in, in the last case here, I'm keeping one fourth of the points. So if I just do the intensity for that one point, that would be a constant intensity of one but I have to account for the fact that I left out the other one, so I multiply by four. And in the other one, I multiply by two or by four thirds or by nothing. So that's, uh, that's basically the idea. And then you just repeat the subsampling. Usually your real data is not four points, but you have quite a few more points. So you can't do all like subsets of 100 points out of 1,000 points. And then, so you just do a random uh, thinning of the, of the point pattern. Um, so if we look at the original Voronoi intensity estimation of the eruptions data, so this is the, the faithful data set from, uh, from uh, base R, from the data sets uh, package. Um, well, then you see clearly this huge variance of the intensity estimate. And um, the, the blue line is kernel density estimation, which probably looks more reasonable. And uh, if we then apply the, the thinning, we get, uh, depending on how much thinning we do, uh, we get different uh, estimates. Um, and uh, our experience is that you need to do a lot of thinning. Uh, so a lot of times you keep 10% or 5% of the data points or something like that, and then just repeat a lot of times. And a lot of times it's maybe 500 times or something, then the curve seems to kind of stabilize. Uh, you can do it a thousand times or however many, many you, uh, you like. Um, and that's, that's basically uh, the message. It's a very simple approach. And for some purposes, especially if you have kind of um, sharp changes in your data that you want to be able to detect, you can uh, have uh, advantages here compared to kernel density estimation. And um, you can use it or not. It's, it's just yet another method for doing your density or intensity estimation. And, and for some things, we, we found that it was good, and for other th things, uh, not so good. Um, it's, uh, it's better at detecting kind of uh, asymmetric things in the distribution that you don't really notice with the, with the kernels. Um, yeah. Um, and then um, there's this thing about what about ties? So uh, if, you, uh, if you have two points on top of each other, then you have a cell of size zero. So what do you do? So the, the easy approach is just to say, well, then we don't have one data point 
in that cell, we have two data points. So we just say instead of one divided by the size of the cell, it's two divided by the size of the cell. That's the, the simple solution. You could try, we also tried uh, jittering all the points, and, but then of course you can get some really, really large intensity estimates. Then again, if you then subsample a lot, hopefully you get rid of all these that are very close to each other and then your problem is uh, sort of solved. Um, yeah. And uh, then of course, uh, the standard thing would be to have a nice simulation study showing, wow, I can construct some specific case here where the mean square error of this method is much better than kernel intensity or whatever. And that's not really that interesting. We, we can construct a simulation study where we in some cases are better. Um, but uh, instead, I'll talk a little bit about the implementation. In case you don't know this Batstat package, it's one of the oldest and biggest spatial packages on, on CRAN. Um, Adrian Badley is the main developer together with Rolf Turner, and then I joined the team uh, some years ago. Uh, they started 20 years ago. At that time, I wasn't involved. Um, and uh, the main thing was point patterns in 2D uh, and uh, in a polygonal window, basically. And then uh, it kind of evolved from there to grow bigger and bigger. Um, so uh, you can import your data from different, like Spats that has its own formats, but there are in the map tools package ways to convert it back and forth through the more standard spatial formats. And unfortunately, we didn't do anything with SF yet. Somebody needs to do with something with SF. Nobody is paying us to do it, so I don't know. Where, but at some point, it'll probably get there. Um, so uh, a, a planar point pattern uh, is of class PPP. And uh, this is the example with the cancer data where I've, I've removed the marks, uh, the types. Um, and PPPs is the most uh, common thing in Spatstat, and there are many methods for PPPs. So they don't fit all on the slide. I can't remember, 120 different uh, generic functions that have like a .PPP version. So you can calculate distances and make different models, etc. So this is really a well-developed class that we've had for a long time. And uh, if you need to do something with a point pattern, there's likely a function somewhere in there that you could use. Um, so uh, for this project, of course, we need tessellations, and that's also something we've had in, in Spatstat for quite some time. That's based on the DELDIA package, um, and uh, we also have quite a few uh, methods for tessellations. So you can plot a tessellation, and what is a tessellation in 2D? Well, it's just a subdivision into nice polygons, and when it's uh, the Voronoi or Dirichlet tessellation, then it's nice convex polygons, all this set. Um, and it looks like this. And, and there are many, you can manipulate them in many ways in the, in the package. And uh, intensity estimation, the default thing that many of our users do is that they have their point pattern and then they want to look at a nice smooth surface of, of what, what does the intensity look like. We're, uh, with, the, with the old history of the package, we're very close related to base R, not very fancy tidyverse, uh, sorry, and it's not on the way right now. Um, so you need to be a bit familiar with base R before this really makes a lot of sense. But for instance, there's the generic function density. So we thought, well, in the point pattern setup, that's the intensity function that makes sense there. And that's just using kernel density uh, as type by default. And then we made this new one, density Voronoi, where you can get the, the other Voronoi estimates. And notice here, I didn't use the same scale on the, on the color axis. So uh, this Voronoi 100% uh, where you keep all the, the points with the, the, the standard Voronoi estimate, then you just see there's like one very sharp peak and you can't see any details about from, apart from that. Uh, and then more recently, we also uh, adopted this idea of linear networks. So what we saw in the beginning of this Chicago street network, and when you see it, you think a little bit about a graph, but it's more restrictive than a general graph because the, 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 it lives in the plane it's uh, embedded, so the distance, the, where the vertices are means that there's this distance between them, so it's not just like an arbitrary graph that you can move around as, as you like with the vertices with, with weights on them. So we have more information than just a, a graph. And uh, these are called LPPs, uh, line point patterns, and we are getting a lot of the methods uh, converted there. And we also recently, in, in, basically in connection with this project, we made uh, the Dirichlet translation on a linear network. So I haven't seen that in other packages. Uh, so we, we made it from scratch only using R code. So, and it's actually reasonably fast. Uh, if you, if you re really need it to be really fast, probably you need to reprogram it in C. But um, 
And you can see what the Dirichlet tessellation is, is just figuring out all paths on there that are closest to this data point. And it becomes a lot of bookkeeping, of where do these things go on the edges, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's there and you can use it. And um, finally, this is what the, the Voronoi estimate with the, the, the resample Voronoi estimate looks like from the Chicago street crime um, data. And um, that was all that I planned. Thank you. Is there any question? Not bootstrap sampling. So why 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 aren't we using bootstrap sampling? Is there a specific reason? Uh, so when when you say bootstrap, you mean with replacement or yeah yeah. I guess it's annoying to have the points with replace. Well, it depends on how you like the ties or not. Uh, I I don't think the the ties add a lot of extra value that you. I'm asking because usually if it comes to the uncertainty of the estimates, the bootstrap sampling is quite nice because it has the same sample size, yeah, so. Yes, uh, but the, the thing here is to do all the math that we have, uh, we use the fact that when you do a simple random thinning of the point pattern, then the new point pattern has the same intensity, uh, just uh, scaled with the fact with the P, the probability of keeping the points. And when we do all the math, et cetera, like if you start with a Poisson point process, you have a new Poisson point process. If you have replacement, you kind of ruin all the, um, like you, you introduce interactions between the points or, so I think the math behind uh, this is working kind of thing will probably become much more difficult, would be my guess. So you are subsampling sub just as a certain size or are you going through all the possible subsample sizes? So, so we just, uh, I mean, we, we just choose one P uh, probability of keeping a point and then if P is 50%, we just go through every point and keep or delete it with 50% chance. Then we get one realization and then we repeat that with a new independent realization where you can have repeated things. So I don't Thank you. Okay. There are another question. Uh, so you have chosen the kernel density estimator for comparison with your method. Have you ever chosen other methods for comparison as an, any, un, uh, any other nonlinear estimator, non-parametric one? So, so like the K nearest neighbor density estimation? Something like or estimation with penalized splines based on B splines, something like that? No, we haven't done any comparison in that, uh, that regard. And yeah, so that's completely open. I am very sure it should be very useful for you. Yeah. Thank you. A small question, maybe last one. Uh, one uh, further question. Is it possible to combine this um, uh, density estimate with leaflet, for example, if you want to display um, this estimated densities on a map? Uh, yes, depending on how, I, I mean, the, these, um, when, when you have the, so, so you think about the linear networks or the, 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 the planar case. Like you have this a one, simple point pattern. Yeah. So, so this one, you can just, uh, it's an im object in spatstat, like our raster object, and that can be exported to uh, an SP uh, grid something, spatial grid, data frame or whatever, and you can convert it to SF objects and, and use it with, with leaflet, etc. But So you need to convert to standard uh, formats from the Spatstat format. Thanks.